Hello, I'm Wendy and that's Beth. Hello. And we would like to take a moment to welcome new listeners. So welcome, Buiti Binafi and Bienvenidos Bitches to Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color. Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color is a weekly podcast hosted by us, mm-hmm. a multiracial, multigenerational set of BFFs. How did we get here? Well, when we realized that podcasts like ours about marginalized perpetrators and victims with hosts like us didn't exist, we just decided to do it ourselves. Yes, so join us as we tell the fascinating stories of the crimes and the victims that often go untold by the mainstream media. And because context is everything, we often add in historical and cultural details of the crimes and criminals in order to get a sense of what might have led to these crimes. We love talking about true crime, but we also use these true crime stories as an opportunity to talk about race relations, systemic racism, policing, history, and culture. We learn something new every day, and we hope that you do too. We are really excited to share that Apple Podcasts has featured us as a creator we love throughout the year. Apple Podcast celebrates well-established podcasters leading their categories, and we were selected for true crime. Hey, Bobby, your horns. <laughs> <laughs> so dive into our feed and share an episode with a friend. You can expect to hear a new episode every Thursday. Oh, and uh, be forewarned, we do sometimes use explicit language, and some of the content we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. But we also have a lot of fun, so join us. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Please take care of yourself. Episode 208, Bienvenidos Bitches and <laughs> Buiti Binafi and thanks for listening and being yeah. here. Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are othered and the victims because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are werewolves. Just kidding. <laughs> not all serial killers are straight, cisgender, white dudes. That's what? right. These crimes <laughs> rarely get any public attention because the news is racist allegedly and we are wendy and beth she's wendy a black latinx woman and i'm beth and i just happen to be white oh man she is one of the good ones it's not enough to just be not racist you gotta be (laughs) anti-racist anti-racist and and anti-white supremacist and anti-oppression and that's what my girl's beth is all about that's what we're about here at fruit loops so she's at the cookout join us continue i'm sorry (laughs) We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists, just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. All right, so who are we talking about today, Beth? Today we're talking about William Henry Hance, a black man who killed four women and tried to blame his crimes on a fictitious cabal of white men called the Forces of Evil. Whoa! <laughs> Hang on a second. There's got to be a sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> the Forces of Evil. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so how you doing, friend? I'm doing good. <laughs> Just kind of freaking out a little bit because Crime Con is almost here. Oh, yeah. It's going to be here whether we're ready for it or not. Yep. And the thing is, all we can do is control ourselves and do our best. 
Yeah. This time last year, CrimeCon time, I was having chest pains. Oh my I god! I thought I was having a prolonged heart attack. Oh my god! Up, and you didn't up. say anything to me. Nothing. I know, but I, it's not like I wasn't saying anybody anything to anybody. I mean, I was talking to my therapist, and like I was working with my physician. Like I had people on the chest issue, but it was just anxiety. Yeah, just like panic, panic attacks. Yeah, yeah and I was meeting with my therapist like twice a week, but I can report. That 2023 crime con time, I'm chest pain free. So (laughs) (laughs) good to hear. I know. I'm looking forward to enjoying it in a different way this year, right? It was so much fun to do those live shows when we were there because we'd never done a live show before we got invited to crime con. We'd never done that or known that it was something that we could do. So doing it was incredible. But now that we're not doing that or a QA, and a I'm really looking forward to just being able to interact with folks and like yeah. shoot the shit and talk and get to know more people and just learn new things and take breaks too. I am yeah. excited <laughs> about rest and enjoying myself and not, <laughs> not like running around like, Oh, where's the printer? Oh, where's this, you know, where's this, yeah. where's that? you know, yeah. just the, the kinds of things that happen when, when a live event is going on, but right. I'm really looking forward to rest breaks and hanging out with people. Yeah. And I think crime con is a wonderful place where everybody who's interested in true crime or has a connection or experience with true crime can all come together, but it can also be a lot. So yeah, everybody taking care of themselves when, when, when they're there. So see you there. See you in Orlando. (laughs) (laughs) Now it's time for some listener. Well, hello angels. Thank you. Ah, yes. What's in that bag, Beth? Well, I wanted to say thank you to Kristen is Good, Mishu, and Gianella for your reviews. Yay! Thank you! (laughs) Thank you! Yes, thank you. And Be Happy, Be Healthy on Instagram said... Instagram! (laughs) (laughs) They said, I love the history and geography. Appreciate it so much. And we said... Thank you so much because we think context is really, really important. Yeah. And I'm really glad Be Happy Healthy said that because we've been getting slammed on a lot on, of on Apple because bad people reviews. don't yeah. want to hear the context they don't or understand the history. It. And they, yeah. they don't see the import of it. And there's lots of true crime podcasts out there that don't get into it. And if you don't drive with Fruit Loops, go find those ones, right? We think yeah. it's important. We know a lot of people. I think a lot of people want the guts and blood. And that's not what we're all about. No, no, not anymore. And sometimes, I mean, certainly, Lord knows, I love it. It's part of the story, but we tell a bigger story, I think. Yeah, there's a lot more to it than than that. And uh, I just think for everybody's sake who's involved, it's important for us to know those details. So I appreciate you. Be happy, be healthy for letting us know your thoughts on it. Yeah, Yeah. So, um... Where are my buttons? <laughs> Who's in charge here? <laughs> so just wanted to say, please send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. And we may feature it on a future episode. Yay. Also join us on Patreon, where we have literally hundreds of hours of bonus content And we have a video club for 12 plus patrons where you can interact with us in person. Yes, in person, live. We do release those video episodes, but, you know, if you weren't there, you didn't get a chance. You missed out on on the live. We edit those. Yeah, we edit them. So it's not as raw what we release. But 12 plus patrons can join us. And they can experience the rawness. Experience the rawness. (laughs) Whoa. Um, And with that said, we just want to say thank you to all of our Patreons. Yeah. We have the opportunity to do some really, really cool stuff in the true crime space and uplift voices of people who we don't normally hear about in the true crime space, not just storytellers, but stories and experiences. So we're really grateful that we get to do all that really cool stuff because of our Patreons. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. I think that deserves an air horn. Excuse me. All right, so before we get into the episode, we would like to take this time to say that this is a podcast about true crime and people of color. True crime is difficult to talk or hear about, sometimes race or other, you know, 
issues in society can be as well. But it's just part of the world that we live in. And we all are global citizens. We all get to talk about the things that are happening in our world. And we want this to be a safe space where we have discussions and conversations and learn about all the things. We're all learning all the time. Sometimes we make mistakes. We just cop to it, learn from it, and keep moving on our collective quest to be our best sexy selves. Amen. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And we welcome our listeners to be a part of the conversation on Facebook or Twitter or X, I guess, at Fruit Loops Pod or email us at Fruit Loops Pod at gmail.com. All right. Well, now we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to get into the story when we come back. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Pete's. Few things start your day better than a good coffee. That's why Pete's hand roast their coffee from a specific selection of high quality beans. And they don't just put those beans into anyone's hands. Pete's trains their roasters for 10,000 hours so they can master the roast that gives you the most. Pete's Coffee. Coffee for coffee people. Find Pete's online or at your local retailer. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. All right, we're back. Remind us, Beth, who is our subject today? Our subject is William Henry Hans, a black man who murdered four women. Most of the murders took place in Columbus, Georgia, during which time another serial killer was also active. In the same area? Yeah. Wait a minute. Who's the other serial killer? Carson something something. The Stocking Strangler. Carlton Michael Gary, the Stocking Strangler. Yeah. <gasps> Oh, okay. Whoa. Well, let's get into some stats and fun facts, shall we? Okay. One second. All right. So Columbus, Georgia has a population of nearly 200,000 residents. And the five largest ethnic groups currently in Columbus are Black or African-American people at 45% and white people at 39%. People who are two or more races, non-Hispanic are 3%, white Hispanic 2%, and then everybody else. At the time that these murders took place, the Black population was about 30% okay. in Columbus. And another interesting fact is that Hans was portrayed by Corey Allen in the second season of Netflix series Mindhunter, which we all love very yeah. much. Am I yeah. right? Yep. So now we are going to get into our love and light segment where we just remind everybody that true crime is true for somebody. Real people lost their lives and left behind community members, family members, friends and loved ones who cared about them behind. And I also imagine at this time period where there was two, not one, but two serial killers on the loose at the same time that the just community found that was out. Yeah, terrified. <laughs> I, I'm, I just learned it and I wasn't even there. And it's terrifying to me. So love and light to Karen Hickman, 24, Brenda Gail Faison, 21. Gail had uh, more than one name that she went by. Gail Faison, Gail Bogan, Brenda Jackson, Gail Jackson all names that are used in various articles. I'm curious how many journalists want to go talk to her loved ones or people who may have known her to get more clarification on yeah. what her name was. But that's the way it goes with BIPOC victims sometimes. Gail Faison is the name used in the court records. And then there's Irene Thurkeeld, who was 32. A fourth woman was killed in Indiana. We were unable to find her name. And then Gabrielle Badger, who was not linked to this case in particular, but there's some speculation about the conclusion of that case. Yeah. And we just want to say rest in power to all of these queens 
So let's get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. Well, the setting is Columbus, Georgia, which was founded in 1828 as a trading post and was named after Christopher Columbus. <laughs> of course it was. The murderous, maniac, <laughs> rapist guy. Go on. <laughs> I knew you would love that fact. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. My, he's he's one of my favorite. Your favorite. And by yeah. favorite, I mean least favorite characters <laughs> the, in history. His favorite yeah. person you'd want to punch in the face. Oh, yeah. I would love it. I would love yeah. it. I mean, just thinking of inflicting the pain and terror that Christopher Columbus and his men inflicted on innocent Taino people and people in, in the Americas. I just, I feel like uh, he you deserves. You want he, it. He, I do. <laughs> I feel so terrible. You know what? I'm going to take a break and go down to hell. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm back. <laughs> Turns out hell wasn't welcome, as welcome that back. different. Wasn't that different from it's, it's present the same, day America? Same as here. Yeah. <laughs> so for hundreds of years before the arrival of the Europeans, the area was home to the creek and was once the site of a creek village. So one thing is that before white people arrived, colonizers arrived, is there were like tons of indigenous and native people on this continent on this yeah. North and Central and South America. And I have been watching a lot of history programs on HBO that there may have been even more people on this side of the world than there were in little Europe and oh, wow. wherever Christopher Columbus yeah. was. But it's, it's just crazy to think about. And they had advanced societies. They had cities with buildings and they had politics. They had laws, etc. And just a whole society, agriculture, just a lot of it is discounted. So when yeah. we do this, I learned so much this week, I just wanted to touch base. Share that. It's, yeah. Just wanted to share that. So when white people began to settle there, where people were already living in the 18th century, Columbus became an important trading center, as well as an inland cotton port with a thriving textile industry. Slave labor also became an integral part of Columbus's economy. By 1860, 37% of the city's population was enslaved. That's a lot. That is a shit ton. African Americans literally built Columbus. Columbus was designed to make use of the water power of the Chattahoochee River for mills, particularly the textile mill. Cotton was needed for these textile mills and enslaved people were used to plant and harvest this crop. Although there were no large plantations in the urban parts of the city, they could be found nearby on the outskirts of town and in the surrounding counties. Just a little culture corner. So since I've moved to Georgia, I've heard people talk about the Chattahoochee River a lot. And I used to drive over it on my way to work every day. And people would say things like, we're going to shoot the hooch this weekend. I'd be like, what? Um, maybe I shouldn't work here. But that's actually where people go tubing and rafting down the Chattahoochee River. And it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. The Chattahoochee is a Creek word meaning painted rock. Oh, okay. But unfortunately, recreation on the river was closed off this summer due to an E. coli inf oh, bummer. infestation. So 2024, here we come. Yeah. I hope that, that uh, gets cleared up so you can shoot the hooch. I want to shoot the hooch so bad, Beth. <laughs> Chattahoochee is also a really fun word to say. Amen. I love it. <laughs> so in town, enslaved women performed domestic tasks. Enslaved men worked skilled jobs as apprentices to tailors, butchers, masons, and carpenters. Enslaved people could also be hired out or rented. There was also a thriving slave market. Although Columbus was a mill town, enslaved people rarely worked in the mills. Those jobs were reserved for white people. Instead, enslaved men worked in warehouses, particularly cotton warehouses and brickyards. After the Civil War from the 1870s to the 1950s, thousands of rural Black people migrated to Columbus to build a better life. After World War II, Black soldiers returned from fighting fascism abroad to demand freedom at home. In this post-war era, the city's first Black suburb of Carver Heights was built. Men and women led the fight for civil rights in the city and across the state. By the 1970s, Black people held elected local offices and public facilities were desegregated. 
Killer Mike has told us numerous times there has been a black middle class in the South for a long time. Hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that. No, I didn't. Yeah. So today, Columbus is known as Georgia's third largest city with a growing community of 200 plus thousand. The city has less than half the crime rate of New York City and Los Angeles. Whoa. If you are in Columbus, you can visit the Black Heritage Trail, an eight-mile national recreation trail connecting 30 African-American heritage points of interest in uptown Columbus. So, so rad. Yeah. Definitely on my list of things to do. Check it out. Yeah. Very soon with the family. So the trail highlights historic sites and monuments that showcase the contributions of Black citizens to Columbus, such as uh, Ma Rainey, dubbed the mother of the blues, and Corporal Eugene Bullard, the world's first Black combat aviator. Wow. Yeah. And that happened in World War I. Holy shit. Yeah. Very cool. I didn't see his name anywhere before this <laughs> yeah. episode. Yeah, me neither. What? So, wow. yeah, check, check Eugene, out that okay, trail. Corporal Eugene Bullard. <laughs> okay, Black Excellence. <laughs> now, this is just a, a fun fact about Columbus. Okay. Columbus is the birthplace of Coca Cola. Whoa. Oh, my yeah. gosh. That is interesting. Okay. Yeah. In 1885, local pharmacist Dr. John Pemberton created the original formula in his pharmacy on Broad Street. Mm -hmm. Pemberton's recipe contained cocaine in the form of an extract of cocoa cocoa leaf, (laughs) which inspired the cocoa part of the beverage's name. The cola Uh comes from the cola nut, which contains caffeine. So it had both cocaine and caffeine. (laughs) Did you know that cola was a nut i did not know that cola was i feel was like a this nut. episode is my brain can't handle anymore this is so much <laughs> too much knowledge information. and we're barely 20 yeah. minutes in <laughs> oh my god it's too much my brain's full what else about this fun fact holy so moly. when coca-cola was invented cocaine was legal and a common ingredient in medicines oh my god <laughs> Oh, uh, wow. I, I love that fact. Doing it is drugs. Doing drugs. That's the funnest <laughs> fact I've heard all day. <laughs> so bordering Columbus on the southeast and south is Fort Moore, previously known as Fort Benning. Ooh, that name gives me chills. <laughs> and it is located in an area commonly known as the Tri Community, compromised of Columbus, Fort Moore, Georgia, and Phoenix City, Alabama. Fort Moore was founded in 1918 as Camp Benning, named for Henry L. Benning, a justice of the Georgia Supreme Court who vocally supported secession after Abraham Lincoln won the presidency in 1860. Benning joined the Confederate Army during the Civil War and rose to the rank of Brigadier General. And we all know what happened to the Confederate Army. Yeah. They lost. And then they named after. the fort after this guy. And yeah, yeah exactly. It. Which doesn't make any sense no, in my brain. It doesn't. But I've never been in charge of anything as important as a <laughs> Navy, as a base. But if they were to ask me, I would definitely look into other choices. I would give it a side eye for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in World War II, Fort Benning was a primary infantry and airborne training center. Fort Benning was also where the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion, the first all-black unit of paratroopers, trained. Very cool. Yeah, and the military is important to black life in general in that it is a way to overcome all of the barriers that might exist for a black person. It's a way to get a job, a stable job, health benefits, et cetera. Yep. Skills, all those things that you might be prohibited from on Wall Street or college or elsewhere. Yeah. Yep. So at the time, the army was segregated with black soldiers generally placed in cleaning or serving positions. The 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion was the first of its kind an all-black paratroop battalion nicknamed the Triple Nickels, which I love. I love that name, too. And I feel like if there is a movie about this, I don't know it yet. Well, there should be. And if there's not, Netflix, call me. Yeah. Now, they were used as smoke jumpers, fighting forest fires ignited by Japanese balloon bombs on the West Coast. These fire balloons were 35 feet in diameter and sent across the ocean with a bomb and drop timer. Uh Uh-oh. Once the balloons reached the American coastline, the bombs dropped and touched off fires in U.S. Timberland. Wow. (laughs) 
We are getting a lot so of fun facts. In I here. know. I know. I had I had no idea. No. Nope. No. Nope. That they were that they came thing. over here yeah. and let and they sent balloons. They sent balloons. bombs over here? How come nobody <laughs> told anybody? Jesus. <laughs> In 1950, Fort Benning became the home of the Ranger School. In 1963, Mm. the 11th Air Assault Division was formed to develop, test, and use the Army's new helicopter-based air assault tactics, which have continued to be central to air mobile infantry operations. And for many years, military dog training was also conducted at Fort Benning. So it's done a lot of stuff. A lot of really interesting stuff. It's just a shame it has had such a shitty name. Yeah. Or a shitty human being. Yeah. But good thing that's been changed. Yeah. Anyway, the Army Training Hub, the base trains soldiers to fight in the infantry, to serve in tank crews, and is home to the elite Army Ranger School. Over 45,000 soldiers and civilians work there. And it contributes more than $750 million to the area's economy. Wow! Fort Benning recently changed its name to Fort Moore in honor of the late General Hal Moore and his wife, Julia Moore. The name marks the first time the Army has named a base in honor of a married couple. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. I mean, you know, people don't join the military on their own. It's often a family endeavor. So I think it's really cool. So Hal Moore served in Vietnam as commander of a cavalry battalion based at Fort Benning and was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Julia Moore successfully lobbied the Pentagon to adopt a policy that military families would be notified of war casualties in person rather than by telegram. The name change had been in the making for more than a year since an independent commission recommended in May of 2022 to rename nine of its bases that commemorated Confederate officers. You'd love to see it. Yeah. So now we're going to get into the early life of William Henry Hance. So William Henry was born into poverty on November 10th, 1951 in Lexington, Virginia. A lot of cities I'm noticing with duplicative names. Isn't there yeah. a Lexington, Kentucky and yeah. a Columbus, South Carolina? Why are they and doing this And a Columbus, to Ohio too, right? Oh, no! yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I thought. Okay. So he was born in Lexington, Virginia. He had one sister, Blanche, who was three years older than him. Reportedly, their stepfather was physically and mentally abusive towards both William and Blanche. According to the siblings, their mother had to work two jobs in order to provide for the family because their stepfather worked irregularly and drank. When William was six and Blanche was nine, their stepfather raped Blanche in front of William. When William was 12, he found his stepfather in bed with a sex worker. This was all reported by the siblings, so we don't know the veracity of these claims. We don't. And I I mean, I wonder, I have so many questions. But it is believed that Hans suffered from an intellectual or learning disability. I think nowadays we might refer to him as maybe a neurodivergent. But an IQ test was given in 1984 and gave Hans an IQ score of 76, which is a borderline disability um, arbitrary score that some white guy in a lab made. Anyway, yeah. although a 1987 test placed him at 91, which is approximately average. But William was a good student, and according to a childhood acquaintance, everyone liked him. William always wanted to be a Marine, and after high school, he enlisted. In 1972, William's invalid mother died. It's been reported widely that her death was the result of a physical attack and a rape, and the assailant was never caught. So I'm curious why you said it's been reported widely and we're not willing to just go with that as fact. Uh, Read the next paragraph. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, her death. <laughs> okay. There, however, her death certificate lists her cause of death as pneumonitis due to Lou Gehrig's disease. So we also don't know how true this story about his mother's attack is. It was reported by William and may have been made up to garner sympathy. Oh yeah. Well, that's, I mean, it's on the death certificate. Yes. I don't see how an attack and a rape could cause pneumonitis due to Lou Gehrig's disease. But well, I'm, not, I'm not totally discounting it. It could have happened. It could have happened. I say that this is the South and anything that goes through the hands of anybody indebted to white supremacy or a white supremacy system such as the coroner's office or the medical examiner's office 
maybe they were trying to cover up for somebody. This is all like speculation, but yeah, the all, conflicting of, all of this is, is speculation. really strange yeah. to me, unusual. Yeah. And I think we don't know enough. And I think it's because of racism. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've been unable to verify the story. So yeah, I looked for newspaper articles and I couldn't find anything about it. All I found was her death certificate. Okay. Okay. A lot of the sources I listened to and watch went with that as fact. Yeah, that's um all of the articles and stuff that I read all uh-huh. went with it as fact too. Yeah. And I probably would have as well if I hadn't found that death certificate. Ah, smarty, smart Beth here. Oh, my gosh. Get her a Peabody. Okay, go ahead. So in 1974, William married a woman named Wanda and the couple had a child. William wanted to make the Marines his career, but Wanda was unhappy. So he left the Marines after serving for four years. And I I don't know how long it takes to get like full benefits or like retirement or pension after you leave. The Marines, but four years seems like a long time to give to. Who, I think that's pretty standard. I Yeah. So within a year, he joined the Army. He was stationed in Fort Benjamin Harrison, an Army base in Marion County, Indiana, then later transferred to Fort Benning in Columbus, Georgia. While at Fort Benning, he served in the 10th Artillery Unit as an artillery unit truck driver. People who knew him described him as quiet, and he preferred spending time with girlfriends over spending time with his fellow soldiers, who noticed that he had a lot of girlfriends. One said, quote, they were always calling him on the phone and some would even come up here trying to find him, unquote. Whoa. Yeah, so he was a ladies man. Yeah, sounds like it. And it sounds like Wanda didn't like it. So she divorced him in 1977, citing physical abuse. He lived with another woman off and on for about a year. And by the time he was arrested, he was engaged to a 20-year-old woman named Cynthia Hudson. His sergeant later testified that he was dependable, trustworthy, and a good soldier. And he did not lose his temper easily. But he was under a lot of stress due to personal, family, and financial problems. He had been drawing extra duty to make more money and taking odd jobs around town but had been barred from reenlistment because of his financial problems, which I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know they would do that. I didn't know either. Yeah, the, I I know that at one point in the military, you couldn't serve if you were a woman, right? Mm-hmm. It used to be segregated. You couldn't be gay and out. Right. You can't be overweight, I'm pretty sure, if you're like serving actively. Yeah. But to have financial issues seems unfair. I mean, it does seem unfair, but I wonder if it has something to do with, you know, somebody might be able to bribe you. Oh, if if you're having financial problems, you might be um, susceptible to things like that. Oh, heck yeah. I mean, if I absolutely. okay, I totally get it now. (laughs) That makes sense. Uh, I mean, anybody could offer me any large sum of money and I would definitely sell my soul. Maybe (laughs) even one of my kids. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. I just went to my happy place. I just went to Maui, and it was truly amazing. Priceline has always been about getting you to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else, like up to 60% off select hotels in Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. On the morning of August 1st, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. You're listening to Stop the Killing podcast. Join us as we take you behind the crime scene tape to explain global mass shootings and mass attacks. I'm Sarah Ferris, but more importantly, this is Catherine Schweitz, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. I spent five years as the FBI's top executive looking for answers to the mass shooting crisis. I've been at the shooting scenes. I've traced heroic acts of bravery 
and I've sat silently and listened to the heart-wrenching stories from survivors. Amongst this horror, there is hope. We all hold the key to stop the killing. You just need to know how to unlock the door. Download Stop the Killing and be part of the solution. Search Stop the Killing on Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. Now, let's get into the timeline. 1978 was the 150th anniversary of the founding of Columbus, Georgia, and festivities began early in the year. Celebration Week was declared to begin on May 7th, 1978. Every Friday was Dress Up Day. Ooh. On the streets occasionally, you could see ladies in long gowns and bonnets with little buttons that read sesquicentennial bell. Ah, yes. (laughs) I thought you'd like that. (laughs) Sesquicentennial bell. Yeah, I do like it. (laughs) Especially when I get to do this. Thank you. But during this time, the city of Columbus was also being terrorized by a series of unsolved strangulation murders of elderly white women. These crimes were not committed by Hans. Later, a man by the name of Carlton Michael Gary was arrested. But this is really important. This is in the South, and white women are turning up murdered. And white women are, at least in the United States, the most valuable, like, The most valuable of women. The most valuable of women. (laughs) Serious, of women. If I mean, if women have any value in this country. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely the white women. And so when something... Not as valuable as men, but... No, absolutely not. (laughs) But... uh, you you go a few levels down and white women are there and, and they are they're a really protected, valued class in the United States. So when something bad happens to white women, it's like all of the forces, law enforcement, the courts, money, philanthropists, the news, everybody swoops in to magnify the importance of this harm done to white women. Right. And everything is done to make sure that it never happens again, yeah. but it doesn't really fix the problem. And so nope. things like this happen again to white so women and happening. all yeah. kinds of women. So yeah. anyway, in some of the strangling cases where there had also been sexual assault, quote, Negroid pubic hairs, unquote, had been found. So the murderer dubbed the stalking strangler who targeted elderly white women in Georgia was believed to be a black man because who else could it have been? And <laughs> If it was a black man, I'm this is how they this is how they solve cases in the South back then. Right. If it was a black man, he needs to die. Yeah. Next. Next case. <laughs> Your Honor. Your Honor. My honor. <laughs> so Georgia law enforcement had made that part of the profile of the suspect public. Racial mm. tensions were high, and at one point the Ku Klux Klan was patrolling the strangling area. It was in this climate that Hans committed his murders. Okay, so this is why context matters. Everybody, are you, are, are you with us now? <laughs> it's just intense time to be in Georgia. So, oh my gosh, I'm sorry to interject here. But then, so after this, then it's the Atlanta child murders. When, oh yeah. And it's right. like, One thing can Georgia another. get a break? No, I guess can't. not. <laughs> so on September 16th, <laughs> 1977, The naked body of a white soldier named Karen Hickman was found in a ditch just outside of the women's barracks in Fort Benning. She did not live there, but lived in an apartment off post. Her clothes were missing. Karen, originally from Omaha, was an army private who had served as a nurse in the reserves before joining the army, where she worked as a clerk. The evening before the discovery of her body, Karen had gone out, and she was last seen at 11.45 p.m. at the Hideaway Club, leaving with a man. There was evidence that Karen had been killed elsewhere. Then her body was transported to the spot where it was found. Her body showed signs of severe beating and also appeared to have been run over multiple times with a car. Near the hideaway club, police found a blood-stained 1976 Toyota in a parking lot, believed to be Karen's. So she was run over with her own car? Yeah. Yeah. Horrible. Awful. Yeah. The very same day that Karen's body was found, the body of an elderly woman named Fern Jackson was also found in Columbus, having been sexually assaulted and strangled with her own stockings. She was determined to be the third victim of the stocking strangler. Because this was such a high profile case, it took attention away from Karen's murder. A month later, an anonymous call led authorities to Karen's blood stained and shredded clothes on a dirt road, but no new evidence was found. The crime was treated as an isolated incident, almost forgotten in the manhunt for the stalking strangler. 
Also murdered during this time was a 22-year-old Black woman named Gabrielle Badger. Her body was found on Monday, October 17, 1977, in a wooded section of Fort Benning Sand Hill area, near where Karen's body had been found. She was estranged from her husband, a Fort Benning sergeant, and was the mother of three children. Gabrielle was last seen driving her children to school the Friday before. Gabrielle's body was found after an anonymous caller called Sergeant Badger's unit and told the person who answered the phone, quote, tell Sergeant Badger he can stop looking for his wife, unquote. What? The caller then gave directions to where her body could be found. Mm. Gabrielle had been beaten to death with a blunt instrument, probably a carjack, but her injuries were not as severe as Karen's, and she'd been found fully clothed. Post officials claimed that the murders were unrelated, and her husband, Sergeant Ardell Badger, was later charged with her murder in a military court. He was sentenced to six years of hard labor after pleading guilty to manslaughter. Oh, that's interesting. So they they, they wrapped that up tightly, but I think there's a lot more to be analyzed. Suspicious of, yeah. Yeah. By mid-February 1978, the stalking strangler had raped and murdered six elderly white women in Columbus. On February 28th, Hans went to the Sand Hill Bar located near the base for a drink. According to a later confession by Hans, while at the bar, he was solicited by Gail Faison, also known as Gail Jackson or Gail Bogan. And by the way, I just, sex work language is something I think that is evolving, but I don't know if it's right to say that she solicited him anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I don't don't know. This is from the court records. Okay. So I don't know. I actually don't know what happened because okay. this is all part of Hans's confession. And oh, okay. I don't okay. think Hans always tells the truth. So I don't Whoa. I don't even I don't even know if Gail was a sex worker. So I you know, yeah. friend, that would make a lot that all those questions I had earlier about Gail. <laughs> That would make all the sense in the world that yeah. it, it was probably just easy to label her a sex yeah. worker. Because she was a woman of color. I met a guy in a bar. Yeah. It, it's just easier. So Yeah. And yeah. he said she was a sex worker. He said he was solicited by her. He, mm-hmm. you know, this is all his story. We don't know what happened, but th- this is we what he don't. said. Yeah. Right. And Gail isn't here to tell us. So exactly. Thank you, Beth. You're Glad welcome. we had this talk. <laughs> So according to Hans, he agreed to a price of $20 and they got into his car. He drove 200 yards up the road to an area she selected and they stopped. She began to undress and Hans became enraged for some reason. Hmm. Yeah, don't know. He got Yeah. Mad. And, you know, we're only getting facts from Hans, but he couldn't right. give us the reason why he became why so he got enraged. angry. Yeah. Stop playing in my face, Hans. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if he, if she, he, yeah, he propositioned her and she said no Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know yeah uh i think it's totally possible he grabbed gail and as she tried to get away he hit her on the head she fell unconscious hence then pulled her out of the car dislocating her elbow in the process he returned to his car to get a jack handle which he then used to repeatedly strike gail in the face the beating was so severe that gail's face was destroyed and bone fragments were scattered around the area the force of Hans's attack was so great that it actually created a depression in the ground mm. behind Gail's head. Hans then buried her body in a shallow grave that he dug with an entrenching tool. Mm. In order to avert suspicion from himself, Hans found an army cap with a different unit insignia than his unit and placed it near the crime scene. Ha ha! <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> That'll. <laughs> Plus, like, was it Scooby Doo style? Yeah. He also decided to send letters to the Columbus chief of police and a local newspaper. These letters were handwritten on army stationery, which he said in the letter not to make too much of because anyone could get a hold of that. Sure. <laughs> wink, wink. Yeah, don't look at the man behind the curtain. It's it's fine. It's totally <laughs> fine. No big deal. Nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> so the chief of police received the first letter on March 3rd, 1978. It demanded that either the Columbus Strangler be caught by June 1st or a woman named Gail Jackson would be executed. The letter was signed the chairman of the forces of evil, a fictitious group of seven white men that Hans made up. Interesting choice of words, the chairman. Yeah. 
that's and what the, the know, forces of evil, which is yeah. so dumb. That's such a it dumb is. name. Yeah, <laughs> but Chairman, that's what they, um, the leader of uh, the Black Panthers. Uh, oh, really? Fred Hampton. Oh. Fred Hampton. Who was he was the, the chairman. Oh, the chairman okay. of the Black Panthers in Chicago. And the forces of evil sounds like that sounds like some FBI bullshit language. (laughs) This sounds like J. Edgar Hoover talk. (laughs) So this forces of evil group is supposed to be like mad that all these white women are being killed. So they're like going to avenge them by killing black women. But forces of evil you would think it would be something have something to do with vengeance or vengeance. evil yeah it's just or it's a silly white name knights white yeah um, yeah yeah what do they call something themselves? like that grand, the grand sign grand the grand Kuka. wizard yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yeah i don't um, know but the language is really it just raises so many more questions yeah first of all why is this letter here And also, who uses this kind of language? (laughs) Anyway, the note read, quote, since that coroner said the strangler is black, we decided to come here and try to catch him or put more pressure on you. From now on, black women in Columbus, Georgia will be disappearing if the strangler is not caught. Unquote. Two more black women would be killed. The author promised if the murderer was still at large on September first is your refrigerator running also you better go catch it (laughs) forces of evil out (laughs) oh god (laughs) sorry 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 sorry. (laughs) so police could find no record of a gail jackson missing in columbus but they did discover that brenda gail Faison had disappeared from a local tavern on february 28th a second letter to the chief Another letter. This is getting, I mean, this is getting weird. Is anybody else asking themselves that question? No. Uh, So a second letter to the chief arrived on March 13th, suggesting that a ransom of $10,000 might secure Gail's release if homicide detectives could not find their man before the deadline. But instructions for paying the ransom were never given. Those would have been really important if anybody were to believe (laughs) this was real. Um, But okay, on March 15th, 1978, Hans went to Vice Mitchell's bar. While there, Irene Thurkeeld asked him to give her a ride to the Sandhill Bar. Irene had married at 18. She had four children and had separated from her husband. Hans agreed to give her a ride. According to Hans, she solicited him while they were in his car. After she removed her clothes, Hans again became enraged and attacked her in the same manner as he had attacked Gail. Mm. He beat Irene so severely that her entire head was missing from her body. Hans hid her body on the military reservation. Santa Maria, that is a lot. A third letter was delivered two weeks later, claiming that a second hostage named Irene had been abducted, scheduled to die on June 1st. It said, quote, you people in Columbus, Georgia, wake up. I think it's in bold letters. It's on in all caps. All caps. Yeah. Wake up. The chief of police is playing with your lives. We have another black woman. Her name is Irene, and she is scheduled to die. In June 1978, instead of Gail Jackson, unquote. Detectives learned that 32-year-old Irene Thurkeeld was indeed missing, last seen on March 16th in the company of an unknown black soldier. Now we're going to get into the investigation and the arrest. So the Ku Klux Klan actually began in Tennessee, and its neighbor to the south, Georgia, also had a heavy Klan presence. And racial tension was already very high at the time. Police who had at first been reluctant to ask for help. um, I don't know. Maybe they didn't want to seem like messy ass stupid hoes. But they were and finally asked the GBI and the FBI to step in. FBI profiler Robert K. Ressler, the inspiration for agent Bill Tench in Mindhunter, Mm -hmm. created a profile which said that the killer was one man, not seven, black, Mm -hmm. not white, single, not well-educated and probably a low-ranking military man at the fort in his late 20s. Ressler would later include his account of this case in his book, Whoever Fights Monsters. Oh, okay. So Bill was the dude 
who played. He was the um, more military looking dude. Yeah, 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 not, yeah, yeah. Not the guy who was in Hamilton. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Clarifies a lot for me. <laughs> so um, in the in the pre-dawn hours of March 30th, 1978, Hans, claiming to be the forces of evil, called the military police and told them exactly where to find Gail Faison's body. The body was recovered that afternoon. The military police who received the call thought the caller was a young black male. Four days later, another call directed officers to Martin's Range on Fort Benning, and Irene Thurkild's headless body and scattered skull fragments were found hidden behind a pile of logs. Tape recordings of the phone calls to the Fort Benning police, which indicated where the bodies could be found, were played for Hans's commander and first sergeant, who thought it was Hans's voice on the tapes. Hans was arrested that day and charged with murder and attempted extortion. On April 5th, he was 26 years old. I like to add in their ages, like just sometimes it's just mind blowing. 26 it years is. old and he's doing this shit. To yeah. think, yeah, to think about what you were doing yeah, at that age. At that age, yeah. Definitely wasn't this. No, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Sorry. <laughs> so the military police questioned Hans and obtained a confession. He also gave a confession to Columbus authorities. He told authorities where he had disposed of the murder weapons and clothes of the victims. They were subsequently recovered. Hans admitted to writing the letters signed Forces of Evil. Oh, thanks. We had no oh, idea. Really? But <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> but claimed that he was compelled to do so by that organization, quote unquote. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hans was then interviewed by local authorities and the FBI over a two-day period. Hans was interviewed for a total of 18 hours. Hans confessed to the murders of Gail Faison and Irene Thurkild, as well as Karen Hickman. Handwriting samples were obtained from Hans and were matched with handwriting on the letters received by the chief of police. A fingerprint from one of the letters was determined to be that of Hans. He would also later be identified with the murder of a young black woman while he was stationed at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indiana. We, unfortunately, could find no information about this young woman. Yeah, nothing. Sorry. We tried. But yeah. if you know, yeah, or point know. us in the right direction, you know where to find us. And we'd be happy to uh, hear from you. The crime was so brutal it was compared to the Manson murders. Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case, explores what it takes to bring new attention to an unsolved double homicide and turns up new hope for answers. Listen to Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case from IdeaStream Public Media, wherever you get your podcasts. So now we're going to get into the trial. What the what, Beth? Well, Hans acted as his own attorney during his civilian trial for the murder of Gail Faison. Oh. He called only two witnesses on his behalf neither of whom could provide him with an alibi. The prosecution called several expert witnesses, one who identified his handwriting on the Forces of Evil letters, and another who identified his fingerprint on one of the letters. I don't know why he went through all of, all of this trial. All these shenanigans. Yeah, yeah it just seems I think like because a lot. he's a narcissist. <laughs> I, I I was going to ask you, friend, I don't mm -hmm. know what label to put on this individual. Obviously, neither of us are psychologists, but I was just curious right. what you thought. Um, on December 16th, 1978, Hans was convicted by a jury in the Superior Court of Muskogee County on the murder of Gail Faison and attempted theft by extortion. Uh, is that because of the letters to the newspaper? Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. he asked for $10,000. Oh, $10,000. Yeah. Gotcha. As he was taken from court, his fiance. Cynthia Hudson cried in the back of the courtroom. But she dodged a bullet. She happy, <laughs> Cynthia. Girl, you you <laughs> was in danger, girl, totally and now you're not in danger, bullet. girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Though the jurors all agreed on his guilt, one, the only black person on the jury, didn't agree with the death penalty. However, the other jurors attempted to convince her. And after she just walked away from the conversation, the other jurors either took that as a concession or saw it as an opportunity to claim that there was a unanimous agreement anyway. 
The juror was too afraid to speak up and Hans was sentenced to death. Sources also say that that jury room was riddled with, with racist, racist yeah. comments, yeah. bullies, etc. And, yeah. you, you know, I think that that's important to consider when we look at the outcome yeah. of this case. On June 7th, 1979, a military court convicted him of Karen Hickman and Irene Thurkeld's murders. He was sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor for those crimes. But his military life sentence was overturned after jurors determined that he lacked the capacity for premeditation due to mental disability. His death sentence for Gail Faison remained in place. So now let's get into where are they now? Tell us, Beth. Well, in death penalty cases, the state of Georgia requires a unanimous decision of the jury. However, the only black juror on Hans's case later came forward and stated that she did not vote to put Hans to death and that the jury foreman lied about having a unanimous verdict. It's not supposed to go that way. No nope. system isn't supposed to let that happen. She believed that he lacked the mental capacity for premeditated murder. In an affidavit, she stated, quote, I did not vote for the death penalty in Mr. Hans's case because I did not believe that he knew what he was doing at the time of the crimes, unquote. A fellow juror corroborated her story and also revealed that deliberations in the jury room were marked by racist comments and statements that Hans was, quote, just one more sorry N-word that no one would miss, unquote. <sighs> wow. Yeah. Um, well, it's easy to not treat people like human beings if you don't see them as human beings. But I think, you know, if it was a white murderer on trial, would they have said it's just one more sorry white guy that no one would miss? Mm, I wonder. I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. But um, it, it certainly would not have been. Um, I don't think it would be racist. Yeah, it would just not. It it, would they just wouldn't be, be referring to his race. They would just be, you know, referring might to be his called, actions. Yeah, or his actions. Or, or, yeah, 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 exactly. It wouldn't be racist. Wait, it sounds like the content of his character, maybe? What? <laughs> Weird. Anyway. Weird, yeah. <laughs> no, his night, I mean, no doubt the crimes are horrific. And I'm oh, not yeah. excusing the crime. Not excusing it, but, but the there's there's yeah, are horrible, problematic for yeah. sure. Yeah, and they're saying this in front of the one black juror, and then people might wonder why she didn't speak up. That's why. That's why Ex she didn't speak exactly. up. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That can you, usually it's twelve jurors on yeah. a on a case like this. So you're the one black person and you are being, you and know, they're throwing around the N word. Yeah. And, like, yeah, you don't know what these white crazy white people are going to do. Yeah. I don't know. They just saw somebody at a dollar store the other day. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. You just so, don't know. You just don't know. So, wow, wow, wow. There's a lot to the story and uh, I'm glad we're here to talk about it. Information yeah. and talk about it. So in 1982, Hans filed an appeal, but this appeal was rejected. He attempted this again in 1983, and though his conviction was upheld, a retrial was ordered for the sentencing phase. At this second trial, clinical psychologist Louis R. Lieberman testified that Hans had an atypical personality disorder characterized by egocentrism and an inability to feel empathy for others. That's not good. No. <laughs> so I read that he uh, diagnosed him with an atypical personality disorder because he didn't fall completely into one personality disorder. So, yeah. yeah. And I also think that medicine has come a long way, but diagnoses, um, there's also racism in medicine. Yes. So the way a black person might present to a medical provider due to survival things, a, white, a black person might not present in the same way that a white person would. And right. so if a medical provider has been studying white people in white written textbooks with based on white subjects, Hans might be like, I don't know what the heck this is, you know? Yeah. And, and, yeah. So and I think that was the issue also with his IQ. I think so too. I think yeah. so too. Glad we got to have this talk. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So according to Dr. Lieberman, Hans was impulsive, suffered from poor judgment, and blamed his mistakes on others. He also had trouble admitting that he had done anything wrong and difficulty controlling his actions. 
but he did know the difference between right and wrong. Dr. Lieberman indicated that the ability to recognize and admit that one had done wrong would be a sign of improvement, but on cross-examination admitted that people with personality disorders rarely improve over time. Oh, that makes me sad. And that Hans had not mellowed in the six years since Dr. Lieberman had first examined him. Hans was again sentenced to death. Hans attempted one final appeal for clemency. He was scheduled for execution on March 31st, 1994. The day before his scheduled execution, the Georgia Board of Pardons and Paroles rejected Hans's appeal. The next day, both a state and federal court refused to halt the execution. Then the Supreme Court, after a two-hour stay, denied Hans's appeal. Soon after, Hans was strapped into Georgia's electric chair. It's been a long time since I've even seen those words in front of my face. <laughs> uh, that I do a true crime podcast, but we haven't. We I don't know if we've covered an electric chair. Not case in a, a long it's, time. It, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. He maintained his innocence in a seven-minute statement before his execution at the state prison in Jackson. He said, "Quote: Why are you executing an innocent man? Why? Why? Why?" Unquote. At 10.10 p.m., he was pronounced dead. Hans was the 231st convict to be executed after the Supreme Court reinstated the death penalty in 1976 and the 18th in Georgia. Wow, they didn't waste much time getting... No, no, 1976 to... Yeah, yeah. That's a lot. So that's the end of the story. Now we're just going to get into our hot takes. What are your thoughts, Beth? Well, Hans was clearly very angry towards women, although at the same time, he had a lot of women in his life. He had girlfriends and Mm -hmm. wives Mm -hmm. and fiancés and all that. Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, he was treated well by his mother. Mm -hmm. But the physical and mental abuse that he suffered from his stepfather, it sounds like uh, that fucked him up. Yeah, the abuse fucked him up. And also, if he's a narcissist, like you're saying, then slights really get to him. And yeah. his, he would have blamed the women in his life for if, if letting he, his stepfather feelings get were to him. Her, oh, Yeah, if you're right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. He always wanted to be a Marine, but had to leave the Marines because his wife was unhappy. And then she divorced him. Yeah. It was said that he was under a lot of stress due to personal and financial reasons. He probably had to send money to his ex-wife and child. And he probably Mm -hmm. blamed her for ruining his career in the Marines. Mm -hmm. He was also barred from reenlistment because of his financial troubles. So he was likely very angry at his ex-wife. And maybe he was taking out this anger on these women that he met. Kind of think so. Kind of agree with you, OG of true crime. (laughs) I also think it's really weird how similar Gabrielle Badger's murder was to the other women. She was hit in the head. And her body was even found in the same area after a phone call, just like the other ones. Yeah. I know her husband was charged and he pleaded guilty, but I wouldn't be shocked if it turned out that he didn't do it and Hans was the real culprit. I mean, we all know about coerced confessions by we now. We absolutely do. And, yeah. you know, given this time, oh, all these white women are turning up dead, plus black women too. What is yeah. going on? Yeah. So I can just get somebody, you we know, just need in somebody. Jail. Yeah. Yep. For the community, for our funding, right. for all of the things to go in. Everybody will be fine right. if we just lock somebody up. Who cares yeah. who it is? I don't know. It's just speculation, but I wouldn't be shocked if, if that was true. Same. Yeah. I already mentioned about the stepfather thing that he was angry, I think, at the women for not, not doing enough him. Yeah. or protecting him from the stepfather. But I think it is human nature. When something bad happens, we have to place blame on something. It's got to be somebody's fault. It's got to make sense in our head. We, as human beings, seek out patterns, right? That's why we yeah. notice people's skin color. That's why we notice right. people who are like us. Because generally, if you recognize a pattern similar to you, that's safe or you recognize that that's unsafe, et cetera. That's how we have survived, right? Yeah, we are pattern seeking creatures. That's true. Exactly. So when things don't make sense or the pattern doesn't make any sense, it has to be because it's somebody's fault, right? right? Like somebody did this. So when things didn't go his way, his inability to pursue his career dreams, financial trouble, his mom dying, then his wife leaving, happened due to many factors we all know. But at the time, it might have seemed to him 
Like it was that woman and then that woman and then all women. All women, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and it just, you know, that was my thought. And I think that the racial tension within the community should not be diminished. Yeah. As it definitely played a part in the reporting of the crimes, the pursuit right. of justice, who got justice, who got media coverage, the jury makeup, the sentencing. I don't understand why he called and wrote letters to authorities like Maybe he was, I don't know if he was trying to divert attention yeah, or I attract think he attention. Was, it, was, uh, it seemed like both. I think like he was both. trying to, yeah, you're right. You're right. It did seem like both. It is weird. Really weird. I don't get it. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> this guy ain't right. <laughs> Yo, no, he, uh, I don't know about this one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm, it's, it's like a head scratch, a head scratcher yeah. of a case. Right. And then if you would like to do me a favor and pull out your serial killer bingo card, a history of violence <laughs> experienced by him as a kid. He inflicted any caused violence and harm on others. And then the military service. So right. give yourself three well, points. Well, look at that. <laughs> yeah, look at that. We're, we're, winning, we're winning the serial killer bingo. Oh, my God. So just a joke. Not trying to be insensitive. So now let's get into how not to get murdered. Okay. <clears throat> If you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. Ooh. I got the Rona, I think. I'm not sure. I'm just coughing a lot and my voice sounds extra sexy. Okay, go ahead. So this segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. Okay, y'all. So this is kind of a piggyback on last week's tip. Sort of just being prepared when we go out. What I'd like to share with you is a tip about getting yourself a go bag. Okay. This tip comes from Margaret Killjoy. Her bio says that she is an anarchist author, trans feminine, pronoun she or they, Margaret Killjoy is trans, and the host of a pod cool people who did cool stuff. Oh yeah, that's a great pod. I love that podcast. So Margaret Kildroy shared this tip on their Instagram. Uh, this is just a summary. So we'll, we'll obviously link it up in the, in the description box, but whoever you are, you should build a go bag. A go bag if you have to go. What? <laughs> Wildfires, hurricanes, right wing militia takeovers, your piece of shit stalker ex-husband is in town, or a weekend getaway. It's a cornerstone of preparedness. If there's a crisis or need to escape or evacuate presenting itself, you got to be prepared with your yeah, go bag. That's a good idea. I love this idea. Let us know what you are putting in your go bags. What does your go bag look like? Let's help all of us, you know, on our collective quest to have the dopest go bags in the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that's it. Okay. All right. Look at that. Shout out time. It is shout out time on our show where we shout out any content by or about any people of color or any other marginalized folks or any true crime goodies. I have, uh, what do I have? Two. Okay. Show on Max called Adam Ruins Everything. Have you ever seen this show before? I haven't seen it. No. It'll change your life. Okay. I, 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 I it, uh, this is what I have to say. <laughs> please don't please don't come for me. But the gun debate, they did an episode on the gun debate. And I had not considered that those of us on the left are like background checks, mandatory background checks, like all these things that are common sense. But the reality is that solutions are not going to be the same in every part of the country. And it is just su become such a big problem that we have to think of a lot of different aggressive solutions to fix it. But at the same time, not everybody who believes in the Second Amendment is a bad person. So yeah. I learned so much from this show. And I feel like once I'm done with this series, I should be awarded a PhD by HBO. <laughs> um, and then this is from our fruity Seth Farr from our Facebook discussion group. And it's a documentary on Hulu called Trap jazz and it's about black people in atlanta in the genre of trap music and jazz it's trap jazz nice <laughs> nice it, it just felt magical 
my eyes felt like they were getting a dose of magic. My ears and my spirit felt like they were getting a dose of magic when I was watching. Awesome. I loved it so much. I've been telling everybody who will listen to me, which is not that many people, that they should watch it. So trap jazz what do you got thanks seth yeah so i I have a shout out from minnie okay she wanted to shout out a canadian cree indigenous artist named (gasps) mackenzie brown okay and her website is camamac.ca and i'll link it in the show notes but it's k-a-m-a-m-a-k.ca Mackenzie Brown. Mackenzie Ooh. Brown, Cree Indigenous Art. Okay. And then I wanted to shout out a true crime goodie I found this week. Oh. It's called Believable, the Coco Birthman story. And it's a true crime goodie because it's a bunch of white people. But okay. it's <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, oh. I've been getting more and more into like scammy people. Okay. Had you heard <laughs> of stories Coco about Birthman scammers? before? No. No, I'd never heard of her before. I think it was like an ad on another podcast or something like that. I was like, ooh, this sounds interesting. Okay. It's a, well, it's called Believable, but she is unbelievable. (laughs) Oh, boy, oh, boy. What are you talking about? So it delves into the dark past and intricate web of lies surrounding Coco Birthman, who became internet famous, sharing her story of surviving sex trafficking as a young child growing up in Germany and then later was arrested after raising money for a fake cancer <gasps> diagnosis. And so Scammy they go through yeah, scammer sits. They go through like all the stories that she told and you know, they talk to her family members and try to figure out what's true and what's a lie. And yeah, it's fascinating. I've been smiling so big about this. That my my teeth are dry. <laughs> Listen, uh, <laughs> that sounds absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. And I I've cannot, binged it. Yeah. I cannot. I'm so excited. So, this is Adam Ruins Everything on Max, Trap Jazz, a documentary on Hulu, uh, Indigenous Art by Mackenzie Brown. Well, uh, you can find Mackenzie's art at camamac.ca. And unfortunately, I couldn't find Mackenzie Brown art on Instagram. So I'm going to go to the website and see if we'll be able to connect you to that, too. And then Believable, which is a true crime goodie. It is a podcast wherever you get your podcasts about the Coco Birthman story. Believable, the Coco Birthman story. And what do you know? Oh, my God. That is the end of the episode. That's it for today. But Beth, (laughs) where can the people find us in the meantime? Our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors or by giving us a five star review. Five stars only, please. Five stars only, please. <laughs> <laughs> also, don't forget to subscribe, which helps us out a lot. Oh, yeah. This is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. bug crawling on me okay i told you these spiders are relentless this is a rude awakening for my um (laughs) wow okay Mm -hmm. well it's a good thing you're here a fellow juror crab a fellow juror rural juror (laughs) there we go yeah Yeah. warm up those arms warm them up warm them up (laughs) may 31st 
She was determined. Determined. She was determined. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Context matters. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I lost my place. Investigation. Investigation and rest. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Golden Girls. Blanche. Oh, it's my turn. Sorry. (laughs) No, I was I was waiting for you. (laughs) Oh. Okay. Didn't realize it was my turn. Okay. Time waiting for you to (laughs) pop up. Okay. (laughs) So the clan, the oh, Ku Klux Klan, that is. You got to oh. announce the section. Oh, I didn't do that yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. Also, the NyQuil Z's hasn't kicked in Uh-oh. yet. So- Uh-oh. Whoops, wrong button. <laughs> Sorry, I moved all the buttons around. Who's in charge here? <laughs> Obviously yeah, not you. Yeah, Louise. Louise. It's definitely somebody else's. Watch me put on my white guy hat. This is definitely somebody else's fault. This is definitely a not me problem. It is a you problem. Um, I saw William Henry and I was like, oh, William and Henry. Oh. But it's just my eyes tricking me. Oh, you know, like oh. that. You know. Oh, yeah. Cooperation is fun when actually it, it, cocaine is fun. <laughs> <laughs> you're, so, you're so crazy. I am so <laughs> silly because I'm so tired. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, it's the end of the episode. Why? <laughs> But I couldn't tell us. Why? Why, God? Why? Why? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so. Have you ever wondered about things that go bump in the night? Or objects in the sky? Or other things you just couldn't explain? Then join me, Jim Howard, on my podcast, The Mauer Report. Each week, you'll find engaging conversations with guests who are authors, historians, and scholars who lend their expertise as we discuss current events and venture into the fringe and paranormal. The Mauer Report hits controversies head-on, yet remains conversational, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other major podcast platform. On the morning of August 1st, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. You're listening to Stop the Killing podcast. Join us as we take you behind the crime scene tape to explain global mass shootings and mass attacks. I'm Sarah Ferris, but more importantly, this is Catherine Schweitz, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. I spent five years as the FBI's top executive looking for answers to the mass shooting crisis. I've been at the shooting scenes. I've traced heroic acts of bravery. And I've sat silently and listened to the heart-wrenching stories from survivors. Amongst this horror, there is hope. We all hold the key to stop the killing. You just need to know how to unlock the door. Download Stop the Killing and be part of the solution. Search Stop the Killing on Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects.